As we come up to Armistice Day and the solemn events around it, and of course the protests which everyone hopes will go peacefully tomorrow, I'd like to look at how Ireland handled its transition in some ways and the memorials to the war veterans. I'm going to look at an article from the Irish Times first. I'm going to share the screen here. This is an article about Irish war poets first to set the scene. It contrasts the work of Tom Kettle and Francis Ledridge, who are two famous poets of Irish heritage. Ledridge was probably the more nationalist of the two. And when he received word of the failed Easter Rising, he responded thus, if someone was to tell me now that the Germans were coming over the back wall, I wouldn't lift his finger to stop them if they should come. By contrast, Tom Kettle, who was also an Irish nationalist, but perhaps not so fervently so, believed that it was important to defeat the Germans and returned to Ireland and became a recruiting officer. Here's the art and the article from the Irish Times, delayed honour the Irish war poets. The politics they returned to men in his only in recent years and the stories of the Irish men and women who died and wrote in the Great War have been heard. This painting at the top is by William Orpen and depicts the rather, a rather horrible event and on a battlefield in World War I and the horrible realities of war. It's a far cry from the propagandist pictures of soldiers marching out to war in cheerful uniforms and the talk of it, the cliche talk of it all being over by Christmas. I'm going to summarise some of the article because I thought it was a very well written article, although it's quite old. Ireland, poetry in the First World War is a story of contradictions, of contrast, and a century later of reconciliation. It should not pass us by that in Irish cities and throughout the countryside, the legacy of the First World War is no longer hidden. So too, in the personal histories of many thousands of families, the experience of fighting in the Great War, or surviving it or not surviving it, has been released into civil society in an understood in a public way that was un inconceivable even 20 years ago. Yes, indeed. When I was a kid, basically, there was still a common view among national, many national families that those who had fought for the British in World War One were effectively traitors. They were airbrushed out of the conversation and the reality of Irish history. They simply didn't exist. You could get funny looks or odd looks of talk to. Yet a large number of people did fight for Britain for whatever reason. Some of them were long-term soldiers as there were garrison towns in Ireland. I'm by no means all of them are Protestant loyalists, no matter what the narrative to try and sell that was over the years. There were many Catholic families with soldiers who served for years as Korean military members. What, as the article continues, whatever about the politics of the war, the reality of Irish engagement is no longer a matter of conjecture or participant uh, interpretation. I'd say there's still some participation an interpretation, especially in the North, but at least now there's a recognition of the value of the men who died and that they were not, can't be simply summed up as traitors simply because the War of Irish Independence occurred more or less directly after World War II. The ceremonies that marked the end of the First World War, the commemorations that lasted until the outbreak of the Second World War in both capitals and provincial cities in Ireland, are now integrating into a more complex history of the entire Ireland and its complicated relationship to itself with Britain and with Europe during the last century, or so too with our literature. Go back in time to say Catherine Tynan from Clondelkin. County Dublin, a good friend and supporter of W.E. Yeats and a response to the killing fields of war in her foam flower of youth. And one recognised how this most popular of poems conveys the yearning of time, that all the suffering and sacrifice was not in vain. Heavens thronged with gay and careless faces, new waked from dreams of dreadful things, they walk in green and pleasant places, and by the crystal water springs who dreamt of dying and the slain and the fierce thirst and the strong pain. 
Yeats, however, was having none of it. Asked to contribute a poem for an anthology he published in aid of those made homeless by the war. In typical contradictory fashion, Yeats both refused and agreed by writing a poem about not writing a war poem. Yeah, this is rather typical of Yeats trying to be, at times, too clever for his own good. The six-line poem on being asked for a war poem begins. I think it is better than in lines like times like these. A poet's mouth be silent, for in truth, we have no gift to set a, a statesman right. This bit further on, where Yeats starts talking about Wilfred Owen and rejects Wilfred Owen as a revered sandwich board man of the revolution actually disgusted me somewhat. Um, it was an attempt to be just ridiculously clever for its own good, especially when Yeats goes on, they may, um, suffering their own, I have rejected these poems when he's talking about Wilfred Owen's poems. Passive suffering is not a theme for poetry. In all the great tragedies, tragedy is a joy to the man who dies. In grit is the tragic chorus danced. The problem was the chorus in World War I was a chorus of machine gun fire blood, and artillery and men moaning as they died. And Mr Yates seems to be, again, attempting to be far, far too clever for his own good there. Whereas Wilfred Owen stood there and watched men die, whereas Yates did not. You certainly don't find this in some other Irish writers who actually did serve, wh whether they were nationalist or loyalist or somewhere in between. I'm not going to read all of this article as it goes on at some length, but I am going to include a link to it because I think it's a very well-written article that sums up the contradictions and paradoxes that sort of underlie the treatment of World War II in Irish literary sources and how it's treated in the country. Why I am going to do, though, is look at two war memorials. One of them is in my father's home county. This is the Kilkenny War Memorial, which was opened in recent years, in 2011. This commemorates the 800 Kilkenny men and five women out of 3,000 odd people who served who died. That's an appalling death ratio. 800 people out of 3,000 never came home. Of those who did come home, many were crippled. My great uncle was one of those who was crippled at the Somme and lived out his life on a war pension for the remainder of his life. So I do have a family connection to this. And although my family would be broadly described as nationalist and verging on Republican, I dislike mocking people who serve countries, and I've always disliked it. It's offensive and particularly rude. It doesn't strike me as a pleasant thing to do. Unfortunately, when this memorial, as you can see, was low was put up, um, some wonderful people decided to vandalise it afterwards. Perhaps they thought they were um, striking some blow for Ireland. They most certainly were not. This is a Garden of Remembrance. It memorialises another war, the War of Independence. It was opened in the mid-60s to sort of memorialise it and hope that there would be peace. Unfortunately, we haven't really quite reached that. This is the famous Children of Lur statue at the front of it, which is supposed to signify a release from bondage. And this is a central pool where you will see weapons cast down and broken in it which is supposed to be a reference to Celtic myths where people throw weapons in as an offering to the gods. If you see the garden from above, which is quite easy to do on the Wikipedia article for it, which has a very large number of pictures, you will notice it's done in the shape of a cross. Harriage Ireland, Ireland also includes the Irish National War Memorial Gardens, which were open to commemorate the war dead for World War I. They were built with 50% British and 50% Irish help. You can see a gallery here, which I'll flick through. This is the garden entrance. 
the center of the gardens, the fountain, the war stone. You can see some members of the Irish Defence Forces there as part of a commemoration. Off to the left side, you'll see part of the Irish Army Band. You can see an aerial view of the gardens. And you can see the cross of the Irish Division. And there's an exhibition of troops uniforms from the period and outlining the various political controversy of the areas and another semi-aerial shot. I'd like to end by saying I'm rather glad, unlike some people in Ireland who seem to think we shouldn't honour these men and women, that we do. They are part of our history. Uh, just in the, as in the same way people like Michael Collins or Patrick Pierce or even De Valera, or in a more modern context, other figures are. We can't ignore one and airbrush out the others, or we rep um, present a very partial and poor view of Irish history. I'll end by saying, I hope all goes well tomorrow, and I hope people remember to behave respectfully, given the nature of the day.